Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Keep It Wassome. Today I've got Nick O'Brien. And let me tell you, Nick O'Brien, he's one of my good friends. Um, he's been doing, uh, when he was in Wassa, he did some of the coolest events that Wassa has ever seen, including Wassa Soup, one of my personal favorites. Uh, right now he's working on an innovation district in uh, Sheboygan. And so uh, please give a warm welcome to Nick O'Brien. You were in Wausau, and then you moved to Eau Claire, and then, you know, what happened from there, Nick? Oh, man. Well, uh, I was in Eau Claire for uh, about a year, actually, mm-hmm. um, and had a bunch of fun stuff going. Like, uh, started a, a, a week called Startup Eau Claire Week. We just, like, threw together, I think it was, like, 12 or 14 different, like, entrepreneurial-type mm-hmm. events, and then I ended up... Um, doing some some work for the co-founders of a of a software company over there. They were starting a co-working space, um, and so I took that project on and, and created uh, basic created this co-working space in their former offices, which they're now they're huge huge company. Huh. Um, but uh, that was fun. And then yeah, went to went to Milwaukee uh, for whatever reason. That city has just had a draw a draw for me. Um, a lot of inspir- I've gotten a lot of inspiration from that city. I haven't really done much in terms of like uh, you know comparable work in, that I did in Wausau and Eau Claire. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more of a I just kind of go and soak up some inspiration, <laughs> and then I go s- to a smaller city and yeah. do it there. So. Yeah, it seems like every time I talk to you and I've visited you down there, you're always working on a project yeah. like in Altoona or yep. Manitowoc. Yeah. yeah, and now it's in Sheboygan. In Sheboygan, so yeah. Malibu, the Midwest. Nice. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so what are you doing in Sheboygan? So Sheboygan, that community um, is efforting um, the creation of an innovation district. So essentially mm-hmm. the city has gained ownership control of a big portion, uh, I should say, uh, probably like 8 to 12 acres of, of mm-hmm. undeveloped land. And, and they're going to basically create a new neighborhood with the focal point being innovation. And I'm mm. the, the director of innovation and engagement for that district. Interesting. So um, I've I've explained this several times, and the way that the metaphor that I've used that's been able to resonate with folks has been when you create these these innovation districts, it's really in two pieces. And so there's like the hardware piece, which is like the physical infrastructure, the buildings, you know, the the internet, you know, the mm. the you know bike paths, parking lots, things like that. Right. Um, but then there's the software piece too, and I've I've been using like a metaphor of like a laptop, what, what you see and what you interact with on a laptop right. is like the metal and the plastic. That's the hardware. But mm-hmm. without the software, the operating system, the stuff that you can't see on the inside, it's just a hunk of metal and plastic. So, so it would be no different with buildings if you just yeah. have buildings and no software. So let's back up. We're talking like a city block basically, or what is this? Like yeah, there's a couple. It's like, I would say it's probably the equivalency of like three city blocks. Three city blocks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so so they're the, the you know the city and the economic development corporation are kind of working on the hardware piece, you know, the physical development. There's a developer out there, um, you know, with with renderings, and there's you know a goal to break ground, you know, uh, in the in the coming interesting the coming months. And I'm in charge of all of the intangible stuff, so the events, the the groups, you know, the all the kind of the momentum in terms of like a culture and and creating a community around this idea of of innovation and entrepreneurship. For for someone who you know doesn't really understand this stuff, like what what specifically what, what specific kind of things go in there? Like what are we looking at? Uh, you mean like in like terms of the programming, the yeah. stuff? Yeah. Well, just like you know, we have buildings. So like, what kind of buildings? Like, what are we? Sure. I mean, about? these are. I mean, again, this is a fairly new concept. I mean, there's only probably a dozen or so communities around the country that have one mm-hmm. of these innovation districts, and Sheboygan will most likely be the smallest community that has one. Um, huh. I think the next smallest is, and don't quote me on this, but like, I think the next smallest is like something like Chattanooga or something, which oh, is like okay. of not comparable, right, <laughs> you know, right, comparable right. size at all. Yeah. So um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty unprecedented. And how big is Sheboygan compared to Wausau? It's about the same size. Oh, same size. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the difference is, you know, with Wausau, which is, it's pretty unique. You've got like, you know, eight other municipalities mm-hmm. right up next to it. So it feels like, you know, a hundred thousand people, which it is. Um, but the city of of, of Wausau is like a 40, 40 some thousand people and Sheboygan's yeah. um, in that area, I think 50, something like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, the whole the whole kind of push behind this is you look at the 
the privately owned business community in Sheboygan County, mm -hmm. you've got Kohler, you've got Sargento, oh, yeah. you've got Johnsonville, you've got Bemis Manufacturing, you've got Sartori, Masters Gallery, all yeah. these huge companies, um, and they're all privately held. So they're all still owned by the families that created them. Uh. And they're, they, they, they work together incredibly well in terms of funding, like, philanthropic things. So kind of um, like Greenhawk here, except for only... Yeah, just, just yeah, add, like, yeah, add just like you know, eight to ten eight more companies ten. to that mix. Yeah. And what's, hmm. what's even more impressive is that they, they're, they're, around the they're around the same table, like, having the same conversations. Like, they, they want to do stuff together, which is, you know... Well, that's good. It's pretty, that's pretty unique when you, you look at some of these, like, mm -hmm. you know, especially, you know smaller communities where there's more of like a kind of a zero sum mentality. Mm -hmm. um, they really care about that community and so, they, and they invest in it too. So, so backing up a little yeah. more, who, who creates the district? Like who pays for it? Sure. Is, it is it these companies coming and helping fund this? Is it a partnership with uh, the city as well? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's structured as a public private partnership, you know, as most mm -hmm. of these big things are, yeah. um, you know, the EDC is kind of serving as an EDC meaning economic development corporation. So like the equivalency of like McDevco here in, in Wausau, um, that that uh that entity is kind of the liaison between the development and and the companies and the business and the businesses, um, and then the city is is committed to a ton of infrastructure improvements like parking lots, you know, fiber mm -hmm. internet, bike paths, things like that, um, and then obviously there's a ton of you know development incentives that are packaged into that as well. Um, so mm -hmm. you know that's where the public support is coming in, and then the private support is mostly. Um, like I said, liaison through the Economic mm -hmm. Development Corporation with the help of other entities in the community mm -hmm. as well. But it's a really, you know, this is a big undertaking. And, mm -hmm. you know, these things, these things take time to, to develop yeah. that you don't just like say we're going to do it. And I think they're two years into the process now. So, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's a fun process though. Yeah. So I'm, I'm envisioning like basically a maker space that's just sure. blowing up into right, two right. city blocks. Like, right. So, yeah, I mean, that's a good, that's a great example. Nail on mm -hmm. the head. I mean, that's something that we're working on right now. There's a collaboration of, of, you know, the economic development corporation and the city and other entities, educational entities coming together to form a, a maker space. Um, we want to, obviously there'll be a, a, a co-working space in this mm -hmm. district as well as mm -hmm. like incubator space and shared office space. So the idea is that you have this kind of a picture, like, you know, just your typical downtown and you've got these like different types of brick and mortar businesses. Um, and maybe you've got music halls and art galleries and th you have this mm -hmm. mix of commercial activity, um, that kind of creates that, that, that feeling or whatever mm -hmm. that activity, the, the yeah. identity of the downtown. It's really no different mm -hmm. with this. It, you want an even mix of the private business world, the educational sector, mm -hmm. the nonprofit sector as well. And, and then yeah. entrepreneurs and startups and people just working and tinkering on things. Um, the idea is that you get all these smart, ambitious, energetic, like innovative type people together in the same space, but they're coming at each other from different industries, different perspectives, mm -hmm. different motivations. And from those collisions, other good things are going to happen. You're just kind of rising the likelihood of these like serendipitous things happening by putting it all in the same location and then programming it, making, you know, events that have a reason for these people to come together and talk about certain things or work on things. So makerspace is a good piece of that co-working space. I mean, obviously there'll be programming space, tons of conference room type stuff. Um, we're working on like a media center where there'll be like, you know, people can come in and create their own media, whether it's podcasting, video, um, podcasting, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, you know, we're also looking at, you know, programs that will help accelerate like investable companies. Mm -hmm. So somebody comes up with a crazy idea for the next, you know, tech, you know, form of tech. Well, we don't have time, you know, to wait around and let that kind of thing surface on its own. So you, you just, you just line up a bunch of resources and take it through a program, kind of like a business boot camp that, that, that mm -hmm. Romy does out at the, at the EC. Um, but a little bit different in terms of the resources that are needed for a company that's designed to take on investment, give up equity, scale super fast, create, you know, 250, 500 jobs in a number of years, and then sell the company to some other bigger company and then do it again. You know, that's kind of that, that startup mm -hmm. journey. Um, and wherever you have a density of that type of activity, you also have a density of talent. And so at the, mm -hmm. at the, at the front end of this entire push um, was th those bigger companies like needing talents, you know, huh. you know, so this seems like, this seems like kind of the wave of the future. Like we're going to see more of these, you know, I was just thinking, I uh, just last week I had Michelle Gage from 
Uh, she's creating the urban recycling app. Oh, cool. I don't know if she was, you might not have been, uh, I think she started that a couple of years ago. Okay. So that's yeah, that pretty new. Sound but familiar. It, but it's pretty cool. So so Michelle Michelle and I uh, worked in the sports department at the Daily Herald. Oh, really? Together back in the day. But uh, she went on to, I think she got a master's and then she ended up doing uh, a lot of grant writing. Okay. Which really helped her when she started this app. Sure. Because there's a lot of grants that she qualified for uh, being, you know, being like a woman entrepreneur and mm-hmm. such. But Man, it's uh, she, she, so much of the stuff she's like her mentors and stuff are all in Madison. I'm like bummer that we don't have more of those resources here. And like this innovation district sounds like almost the perfect thing that for where she would need to be. And even something going back to like Wasson Wafers, like I could have used that kind of uh, infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, and you know another big element of it is like like with anything is capital you know people you know to to scale these things quickly you need money behind it yeah and um you know that's a big advantage of the Sheboygan County area is you have mm-hmm. you know these privately held companies um and currently that capital you know a, 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 what the public sees of it is spent philanthropically you know to support art centers and mm-hmm. you know you know your nonprofit community and and new parks and things like that um and and now there's this you know this interest in potentially putting some of that capital to economic work in the sense of creating companies that will create jobs that will create more right. reasons for people to to be there to live there to visit there mm-hmm. um, and and so there's like there's a there's a kind of a science behind it but really it's it's pretty simple you know you just want to centralize unify all this similar type of activity in hopes that it will draw more and create more as a result. So are these companies putting in a lot of, they're putting in a lot of capital to uh, startups and helping that launch those types of things? Yeah, I mean, that's... Or is that kind of planned for the future? Yeah, that's... The district kind of gets... That is, a, that is an intention okay. or at least a direction that, um, you know, that I think will result from, from this type of initiative. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, certainly there's... You know, I I'm, I'm, I don't know this for certain, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of those companies have some sort of, um, you know, family office is what, that's what mm-hmm. they call them, uh, you know, investing in uh, different things, um, you know, just trying to put their money to work. Um, this would be, you know, geared at investing mm-hmm. in things that, you know, local things, you know, so companies mm-hmm. that, sure, they may fail, but just the investment in that and the practice of, you know, a company trying to scale um, is is beneficial in the long run, whether, whether it, it scales and, and you get a 10x return or or you get you know a 2x return on your investment. Mm-hmm. Um, just the process of going through that is it's so beneficial and it's like it's just sticky. It just has this draw. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not saying we're trying to create a Silicon Valley because that's certainly not going to happen. But Silicon Valley, had, you know, is kind of like your first iteration of like an organically formed kind of like innovation. Um, environment, right. you know, you just have all this this activity kind of happening, um, and and these innovation districts are more or less like a an analysis of stuff like that happening, and then putting an actual design to it, you know. Right. Well, it's kind of it seems like a little microcosm of that. For sure. You know, yeah. that, like I like that idea that we can take the sort of Silicon Valley model, but make a little micro version of that and put it in all these cities around the right around the state. I mean, how great would that be for the economy? For for growing jobs, for growing innovation. I mean, you know, and making Wisconsin a place where people want to come to. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting, you know, obviously seeing, you know, being in a few different communities in this state in just the, I guess it's been what, like uh, almost eight years that I've been here now, but living, mm-hmm. in, you know, and working in four different regions of the state. And you're from Missouri, as I recall? Correct. Yeah. yeah. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Um, you know, these, these, this, these cities. You're not a Cardinals fan, right? Uh, I mean, I if I'm watching baseball, I'm probably watching the Cardinals. But okay, well, yeah. Edit that part out. <laughs> um, but no, I was just okay. actually having this conversation with somebody in Madison mm-hmm. last week, um, who who's doing you know very similar work on a much bigger scale. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, the value of Wisconsin's like m- the multitude of metropolitan areas. Like this, yeah. this state has like eight different, like solidly distinct metro areas, which is really unique for a state of this size. Yeah, that is surprising. 
And and they're all like I said, distinct in their culture. They're very different. They're yeah. distinct in their like their geographic um, assets. You know, mm-hmm. you, you you got Sheboygan, who's like like I said at the beginning, like a Malibu of the Midwest. And you go across the straight and the state in Lacrosse is, you know, you got the Mississippi River and these like gorgeous bluffs and amazing like marshes. It's just the 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 diversity of of geographic assets that the state provides is awesome. I think the same thing yeah. exists for the economic assets. And so what we were talking about is the ability the, for the state to actually have these metropolitan areas work for it, not against one yeah. another. And if we could have different niches for like startup activity or innovation activity, mm-hmm. we kind of develop our own little, um, you know, kind of localized uh, innovation economy, um, which, you know, would obviously lead to, um, you know, a more sustainable way of mm-hmm. doing things, especially in a time like now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I went to Sheboygan once, and I, you know, this was probably, oh, this was more than ten years ago, uh, probably about twelve or fourteen years Things ago. Things have changed. I, I remember thinking the downtown was like pretty cool, and like it had a lot of potential. And I bet, yeah. I bet I'd be curious to go back because I bet a lot of that potential has started to become realized. Because I think I think overall there's just been a stronger focus in downtowns, and you know, got to give a shout out to the River District because our downtown is doing pretty darn good. Yeah, it is. Minus the mall, but you know. It'll get there, man. Well, you know, the, you know, stuff's happened on that. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been trying to keep up. That's cool. Yeah, I've been trying to keep up. I still have uh, Wausau, Wisconsin Google alerts, so I get oh, emails when Wausau's in the news, and that's good. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, what have you seen? So you've been in a few different communities now, and around the state, and now you, when you were in Wausau, one of the first things you did after after being a sports reporter was that you were kind of like the YP guy at the right. chamber. Yeah. And I know like a bunch of YP groups popped up around here mm-hmm. and they seem to all be gone. You don't hear anything out of, I, I, I'm sure one or two of them have to be around, but you, you never hear anything out of them. Sure. And I wonder like, what are you seeing like in the places you've been? Has, has there been a strong YP groups or have they kind of fizzled? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, it's a phase thing. Yeah. You know, so the people who were behind the creation or, you know, the, the, the management of those groups, you know, they've, they've kind of phased into it, you know, evolved into a different phase of their life. Sure. And I also think that, um, you know, and I don't want to be overly critical here, but mm-hmm. I, I think we, we figured out that maybe membership driven groups weren't maybe the best, a tactic for engaging, you know, uh, an audience that tends to be drawn more to organic stuff, you know, yeah. you know, and not like tell me where to go and network, you know. Um, well, I think Walsh's well, Soup was probably a perfect example of that. Sure, you know, I guess. Just to kind of pat you on the back a little bit. But <laughs> I mean, really, it was it was I remember everyone that went to the first one was like, wow, this is like this is like something you would expect in Madison, not Wassa. And I, I remember feeling like that too. I thought, wow, this is really cool. And um, yeah, I'm really patting you on the back, aren't I? But I was just really, reminiscing I mean, about soup the other day, actually. But, but I yeah. mean, you know, for all credit due. I mean, it was a cool event and it added a, something unique to Wasa that we didn't have. And frankly, nothing's replaced it since. Oh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, there's a ton of stuff going on. You know, there's all kinds of oh, stuff happening stuff here. On. Whitewater. Whitewater that... has, been, uh, has been a gem. And right. It's, why I'm here, so shout out to my sponsors at Whitewater. Right, yeah, it's, I mean, this is, un- unfortunately, it's my, it's taken me this long to get here, but I still have had FOMO every time I scroll through something on Facebook <laughs> and I see something that that Whitewater's doing, it's, uh, uh, I've been, I've been meaning to get here for a long time, and in fact, I was, I was, I was planning to attend um, the Emerging Leaders event here oh, last okay. night, speaking of YP groups, mm-hmm. um, and, and it, for whatever reason, got, it got canceled, so, so here I am. But, but yeah, I guess in, in other parts of the state, I mean, there's still solid, you know, young professional groups. Um, I think, you know, it's created uh, generally a certain type of audience and it's like anybody, it's not just young professionals. I like, guess I feel like event wise that uh, I don't think we, I, I'm not seeing like the uniqueness that, that okay. we have from something like soup. There's a lot of like, you know, the stuff we've kind of always had. And sure. that's that's a little disappointing. Yeah, this place has been a gem though. This has been yeah. this place has come like a cultural touch point. I mean yeah. it's you know, beyond beyond my expectations, to be honest. Like I had no idea that this would become what it has. Yeah. So it's it's pretty impressive. I mean that and I think that's I think that's due to Kelly and Leslie just being like, You want to do something here? Yes. Yeah. How do we do it? How do we make it happen? 
and, and you hit the mentality right on the head. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what it takes to kind of just – it's all it really takes is to, to do, mm-hmm. like, unique stuff that draws people. It's just y- y- be a platform. You know, right. don't, don't, don't be a leader, just be a platform. You know, if people come, if you're doing cool stuff, it'll draw cool people with cool ideas. And instead of trying to like, you know, kind of like, you know, bureaucratically make those things happen the way that you want them to happen, just empower the people who had the idea to, to, right. to make it happen. And then it will become so authentic and so organic. And, and then it just draws more of the same type of stuff. So, I mean, there was no doubt in my mind that a place like Whitewater would excel because Mm -hmm. I knew they were going to go into it with the mentality of being a platform. And when you do it that way, you naturally draw Mm -hmm. all types types of people. You become a melting pot of different ideas and perspectives, um, which is really what you're, what you're hoping to create from the beginning. You just got to kind of sometimes take your hands off the wheel and maybe just let the bumpers, you know, just be the bumpers, just keep it. Well, not not a lot of people have that attitude, you know, and I, I, I can understand. There's there's certain times when you do have to, you know, you can't be everyone thing to everybody. Right. Depending on what your space is, but in their case, and I think they've, you know, um, I think they've had to say no to a couple of things recently, but for the most part, they've been pretty open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you, I mean, it's it's so tough too, because I mean, it is. You can get into like a mission creep type situation, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you if you were good at kind of understanding people's visions, um, like for what they want to see happen, then you're good at probably understanding how that can weave into your mission or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe your mission is just to be a platform for the community. That's my, that's what mine always was. Just like, like I had a, I was in fortunate to, to be in a few positions that I was at, had a seat at the table a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And I, and you know, in darn near every meeting that I had a seat at the table at, I was like, man, I wish like this person were here too, but they would never be invited to something like this. So it's kind of my obligation, my duty on behalf of that person to try to be their voice, you know, at this mm-hmm. table. And, and that's all soup was about, man. I, I had, you know, been here for a decent amount of time to have heard so many people's ideas of, for, for community enhancing projects or events or organizations or whatever it may be. And I'd always say the same thing, like, Hey, have you talked to so-and-so about this? You know? Oh yeah. I emailed them or I called them and they never got back to me or I actually did tell them about it. And you know, they kind of just was like, Hey, good idea, but we'll take care of that. You know? Yeah. And I just kind of was like, well, these are the, we're, we're turning away things as a community happening yeah, because we're creating, only allowing so many people we're creating gatekeepers. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm like, that's what soup is all about. Like I have a platform, you know, the economic development corporation. I want to be the stairs for people to get up on that stage, you know, and there was a literal stage involved most of the time at soup. Was. So, and then the vacant building thing just seemed like a fun way to, to create a buzz, you know, yeah, you, like you and your fucking vacant buildings. Man. <laughs> It became my ongoing thing of like, is it in a va- every time you say something to me, I'm like, is it in a vacant building? Yeah. No, that was I'm still doing stuff in vacant buildings. <laughs> well, you know what? It's not a bad it's not a bad thing though. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of a bummer about the WPS building. They were Yeah, I haven't heard uh, I haven't I'm not caught up on that. Well, I don't think anyone's made it public, but I think I, th- I don't think that project's going well. Oh, it sounds some, like we're about to make it public. I think there's some hang ups, yeah. I might be breaking the news on, on the podcast here, but Scoop. Yeah, I scoop myself. <laughs> but it, it was a cool idea. But it, you know, speaking about organic, like they were, so they were trying to create that um, co-working space there. Mm-hmm. And there's another co-working space town on the north end that's like dedicated to it. But you know where it's become the biggest co-working space? This place, right here. Yep. Yeah, you see people all the time, and like that's the other thing. They're they're pretty cool about like you don't even have to really buy anything. I mean, you could just walk in and start working, and they won't bug you. Yeah, I don't. I I feel like I should support them if I'm here. You know, it's right. You know, it costs them a lot of money to run the space, and I'm always cognizant of that. You know, as someone who's founded businesses himself and right. side projects, yeah. so like I know there's things cost money. So I, you know, I want to support them, and they're good people. They're doing good stuff. But yeah, but I mean, it's cool that they have that attitude, and like whenever one, honestly, whenever someone asks me, like, hey, where's a good place to? to go work for a few hours or for the day i'll be like go to whitewater yeah i mean Mm -hmm. i might set up shop here 
tomorrow morning and, and, and do some email response or something. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah. I'm, uh, you're, I'm feeling drawn to work here now that we're that I'm kind of envisioning it as you talk about it. Um, well, it's perfect because they have I, – I, I pretty much live here now. <laughs> I'm like, you got a either, cot in the back or I, what? I've, yeah. I've, like, worked out of here for days because I'll just be like, I need space. I need silence, mm -hmm. you know, or I need, like, some time. And um, upstairs – or I'll go work upstairs. Um, you know, they got these wide open spaces. It's really great for like grabbing a beer with someone because you're not like you don't have a million people on top of you. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's worked out so well in so many different ways. Yeah. 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 It's 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 really a it's really a big Wasa success story. I think. That's awesome. And you know, when I I was still around, um, and I was I think I was still at McDevco when um, when the when the, the one Kelly, of the sisters, Kelly. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know we. I, I was because that was I mean Patino was where you know I worked most of the time. Oh yeah, and That's and back too now. And Kelly was a was a barista there, and I remember we struck up conversations and had a couple coffee meetings, and she came back to me like two or three months later and told me that they were thinking about doing this, and I was like, how can I help? Like yes, <laughs> like that building needs That's to be awesome. something. I'm a huge sucker for mm -hmm. live music and art, and it, it, I was like, I couldn't think of a better way, uh, you know, thing to put in this building. Is she like the sweetest person? On the oh world? my gosh, yes. Yeah. I I hope I get to run into her at some point when I'm when I'm around this weekend. Yeah, I hope so. Usually, one of them, one or both of them, are up there almost all the time. Okay. Yeah, I, I saw Leslie was over by the um, by the couches by the big windows. Okay. They call that the beach because all the light comes in. Yeah. So how does it work here? I know they I've seen stuff on on social media that a lot of the music happens right there like kind of in the in the in the tap room area or that. Yeah, so but then they have the hall too, right? Yeah, so the big shows go in the hall. Okay. And then um a lot of times like the smaller acts. Like there's this guy Anthony Lux who Okay. um has this like he plays on a keyboard, but he has like a pretend piano that basically tears down and fits in his car so it looks like he's playing on a on a piano wow and he's like he's he's got like the elton john like showman you know right foot up on the keys kind of a mm -hmm. thing it's, it's really cool like he's played in there um the sub styles played there um for their ep release party and they probably could have been in the hall because they had so many people right it was packed i think that harold don't you think that was probably the most packed it ever was yeah yeah you probably can't hear him. It doesn't. He's not mic'd up. But yeah. he said, "Yes, Brian, you're a genius." Yeah. Is what he said. Just so you know. <laughs> um, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, I'm sure this place has just added to Wausau's already, you know, stellar music scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, it. You know, having. I don't know how it works with, with you know, shows here and shows at Malarkey's at the same night, but that would just mm -hmm. be like, like. Nirvana, like you know, just going oh, right. right from one spot to the next. You could go right from yeah, because uh, what I, what what I like about their shows is that they usually have them at seven or eight. Oh, so they're earlier here. Yeah. Oh, so it's like you can open up your night here and then you head over to Marquis for over a ten p.m. Yeah, show. Exactly. Nice. Yeah, and I I like because I can go here and I can still go home and go to bed at a reasonable time. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. old as shit. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember I tried to drag you out for a few shows at Malarkey's and. You'd, yeah, you'd, I, you'd hang out, but then you'd leave it like the first break. I'd go like I'd go for like an hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't go yeah. there. I hardly go there at all anymore. Yeah. I feel bad because I like they have such good music, right. and uh, I'm like open. And the one, yeah, the one thing my my one criticism, and you know, that's just my personal taste is like I'm not huge on bluegrass. Sure. So I don't mind it, but I don't get that excited about it. Sure. Like, I would say most of their main room acts have been have been bluegrass stuff. Yeah, um, they had uh, Nick Anderson and the Skinny Lovers last yeah. week, and I went to that. That was yeah. Have, had you seen? Did you seen Nick Anderson before? Yeah, in the four hundred block. Okay, they played the four hundred. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're an Eau Claire band. I saw them a few times when I lived there. Yeah, uh, they can make good music. They're good. Yeah. yeah, they had they had a little bit of a rough start on the four hundred block. I think. Oh, really? Well, I think it was a bigger crowd than they were used to. So. Uh. I, I yeah well I came in I think I came into it late so I didn't witness it but that's what my boss said like they sure. were super nervous sure. and you know the one problem for me uh, from a photography perspective is that there's like two front guy two guys basically in the front of the band and they're like they were like way on opposite ends mm. you know and usually to get good band shots you kind of want to stack people so you sure. want someone in the foreground and so that was impossible you know it had to be kind of a single shot but. Um, yeah, their their show here was good. They were they're very solid. Yeah, I really wanted to come up. It was a couple of weeks ago for a show here, um, 
them Kool-Aid boys. Oh, yeah. I almost, I seriously, they I was like, out. something fell through that night, and I was like, I'm just going to drive up to Wausau and do that. They uh, had, uh, yeah, they had, uh, that was like one of, like, they had a run of like three sold out shows. Really? Yeah, and then hardly anyone was here for Nick Anderson. I felt kind of bad, but. Yeah. Yeah, decent. I mean, you know, decent, but not not a great crowd. But right, right. As long as they, as long as they have most of them uh, sold out, I think that's right. The thing. Right. It was another show. Um, I almost was last week or the week before. Alex Rossi was at Malarkey's. I man, I can't tell you how much I miss music at Malarkey's. Like, yeah. Liz and I talk about it all the time. And that's <laughs> like, crazy because you're living in Milwaukee. You would think it's we just there's not it it doesn't exist. The place like Malarkey's just I have not I have not found yeah. it anywhere else. Then you say didn't you tell me that everything's kind of spotty? Like once in a while, one place has a good band, and you, right. have, to, you have to kind of like really watch the listings or something. Right. Well, and honestly, I'll, you know, like there's a ton of venues in Milwaukee, and a ton of great venues, um, and there's more popping up every you know every week. It seems like, um, but I'm more, you know, there's 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 theater venues. You know, obviously, you've got the Pfizer. Mm-hmm. Just a big arena venue. Um, you know, you've got the back room at Collectivo. Uh, that's a great venue. But then, you know, I really adore these like small, intimate shows. You know, yeah, me too. With original music from bands yeah. you've never heard of. You oh know, my gosh. and and that's that's what I fell in love with at Malarkey's. Mm-hmm. Like Tyler does such an incredible job of of c- curating that type of an experience. Dude, mm-hmm. I've seen a Grammy award winning guitarist on that stage um on a tuesday there were like 14 people there i was i was just it didn't even seem real that's crazy uh, davy knowles davy knowles davy i knowles. remember that show like you heard you 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 play guitar right mm-hmm. you know davy knowles i've heard of him because of malarkey yeah, yeah he's, he's amazing and then i i'm 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 like just kind of desperate for a lucky dutch mm-hmm. show for another lucky dutch show mm-hmm. i've we I, I and we're so close to Chicago now, and I, we haven't been down to a Lucky Dutch show. It's just, it just won't be the same as, as yeah. it's been at Malarkey's. We we saw him in Mo- Monaco over the summer, and it was great, but it uh, wasn't Malarkey's. Monaco's got quite a music scene up there, dude. Yeah, their the brewery puts on some good shows. The bre- yeah, the brewery, and the, there's like a few places in town that hold live music quite a bit too. Like, mm-hmm. um, a friend, my friend Bob and Allen Brothers, they they played up there in Monaco quite a yeah. bit. Yeah, I think. I think uh, Substyle has too quite a bit. Mm. Um, yeah, no, uh, Malarkey's has a show for St. Patty's Day on Tuesday. Yeah, and it's at eight, so I'm like, nice, exciting. I yeah, go. yeah. Is that uh, who's playing? Oh gosh, I forget. Yeah, I can't remember either. Um, but you know what? I just came across in my feed from uh, I think it was three years ago. Is when uh, when Circle of Heat came up. Oh to Malarkey's, yeah, and they had that uh, guest guitarist. And they played a they played a full Almond Brothers set. You yeah, know yeah, that? yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my God, was that good? On, and then I just saw that Tyler posted um, they're they're going to come and do another Rage set oh, uh, soon. I might have to stay up and stay up past my bedtime for that. Yeah, I I will never. That was maybe my my favorite live show ever I've ever been to. Is that is when wow. is the Circle of Heat Rage set the weekend after the election in 2016. <laughs> Yeah, rage is probably appropriate music for that. It was, I my it, the energy in that space was incredible. Like when I come across that Almond Brothers set, I'm I I I was still like I'll sit and listen to the whole thing. Right. I'm like, wow, this was so good. Yeah, they play it's it so to a T, like it's to a T. Like I'm not a huge I'm not huge on cover shows, um, but. It's, yeah, something about them doing it, it's really fun. Right. Yeah. You, and you know what's interesting? So And I like their original too. So, their original stuff is so awesome. they did the they did a couple rage sets. Um I think I saw two rage rage shows um at Malarkey's before mm-hmm. moving to Eau Claire. And then they did a rage show in Eau Claire on my birthday. And it was I mean they was at their they've gotten some uh, a few more music venues now, but this was at the plus in Eau Claire. It's a pizza place on one side and like an arcade and then the other side is like a music venue. And so they were doing a rage set and people were sitting down. I was just so <laughs> taken aback. Like 
Like there were ch- chairs and tables like right up, like there wasn't even really like an area for like, like a, like a mosh or area or whatever, not a mosh area, but you know, Gathering and so I just stuff. like walked up to the stage and like off to the side and like stood right next to the stage, like leaning up against the wall, like trying not to be in people's waves. So I'm like, I'm not going to sit down for a rage set. Like, I'm just yeah, not going to do it. It's not right. Yeah. You know, one of the best shows I, one of the best shows I ever saw live was, was actually gold. Mm. Did I'm I seeing them next brother? weekend. Are you really? Yep. In Milwaukee? Yeah. Was... In Milwaukee. Nice. Yeah. At the, at the, uh, I saw them, was it, uh, it was probably a few months ago, they played a show at the Cooperage, which is a new, a newer venue in, in Milwaukee. Good, great venue. Super industrial, like, kind of warehouse mm-hmm. type stuff. Um, boy, they put on a good show. I feel like I don't even know how to describe her to people, except, like, I don't, remember, I don't remember if you came up with this or I did, but she's like a young Madonna. She is very yeah. much young Madonna. Did you did you tell me that or did I tell you that? I well, can't yeah, I, I've i always thought that. And I saw, you said it. The, said I saw him for the first time in 2016 in mm-hmm. Appleton. Um, and then I ended up hanging out with him that night. Right. Yeah. And on a yacht of all, like, it was just so random. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But welcome to my life. <laughs> well, it's so, well, it so funny. So I, I saw them at the Energy Fair, and uh, I was there before the show. And I was like, yeah, I wonder if I'll see her walking around. And then I saw this this woman in, like, this flowing white, like, like uh, cape with mm-hmm. uh, wearing, like, a le- like a white leotard mm-hmm. and this, this unicorn hat. And I'm like... Probably light up shoes. And I'm like, yep, that would be her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's... Uh... The, the, the eclectic nature of her performing, of her voice, of her like lyrics, it's it's really intriguing. It was just amazing the way, and I, I read later on that every show she tries to make connections with people. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, I saw her do that like a bunch of times. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, it's so strange that she just has the ability to, to do that. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, and some, still be crazy and acrobatic and weird. Right. Like she just combines all those things into one show. And that's kind of what makes it so amazing. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting with you see people who are so effective, if that's a maybe a sterile word to use, but effective on in their performance. And yeah. they're not the same in, in person. You know, it's like they just get into a flow state when they're in that in that environment. And right. Um, and they're just able to do things that are kind of inexplainable, you know? Yeah, I just, I, I've never seen a performer like that before, yeah. ever. I mean, I feel like I've been to a lot of shows, and um, yeah, we're, we're, so they must have, you know, they must have jumped a few levels since then, I imagine. Oh, yeah, they're, um, mm-hmm. I mean, they. I don't know what they're, what they're up, to, up to now, but I know they've put out a couple more albums since I saw them mm-hmm. the first time. They but, did some n- uh, national tours, and yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'm trying to think uh there's a festival coming up um this summer that Liz is planning that sh- they're trying to get gold to headline. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cuz I mean actually I I believe I discovered them on Spotify randomly. Really? You know, so I had no idea they were from Milwaukee at first. And I was I'm trying just... to remember how our conversation uh, how how we came into oh, be. Oh, you know, no, I know how I I came across them. I used to go to um I used to go to UWSP's radio webpage and they would always have these album reviews or they, no, they put out like a top 10 albums and then I would go listen to them. Cause I'd almost like, like almost all of them. They had, you mm-hmm. know, the people they had at the time were just picking some really great music. And it, it was right around the time that I discovered always. Okay. Um, I also discovered gold and, uh, you know, so both at the same time were kind of like bands I really was really getting into and the funny thing is, like, always is from like Canada, I think. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. and then Gold is like from basically my backyard, you know, Milwaukee. Right. Well, I mean, that's what I think that's uh, they claim Milwaukee is home. Um, Margaret, though, is from like Louisiana or something. Yeah. And yeah. she spent some time in California. And I don't know exactly. Yeah. She's got an interesting path, I think. But, you know, most mm-hmm. musicians do. So, yeah. <laughs> uh. Well, yeah. Like, even, um, you know, I, I interviewed Adam Gruel from Horses and Hand Grenades. Oh, nice! Yeah, a while ago, um, last November or something like that, and uh, he was like, "Yeah, our band lives like all over the Midwest." Like, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, most of them, I, I think only him and one of the other band members actually live in Wisconsin. I think the other ones are like Chicago or yeah, Minneapolis, yeah, Minnesota, somewhere in Minnesota. Well, coming back to Wausau, though, I mean, I'm still talking about the bands that this place produces, <laughs> like. 
I yeah. mean, I was listening. I, I listened to your um, to your podcast episode with Parker uh, the other day, and you guys were talking a bit about just like the ecosystem of 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 music here, <laughs> and everything from like the conservatory to Malarkey's and everything right. in between. You you got this. You know, the community has this kind of a organically formed ecosystem of of resources. Uh, that just produces amazing musicians. Yeah, and there's also a lot better. So when I was growing up here, everything was either blues or metal. Mm-hmm. You know, and this weekend happens to be a blues cafe weekend. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You know? um, but it was either blues or metal. Like if it was younger people, it was metal. And I could never understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when we were in a band, you know, we kind of like, you know, that was like 20 years ago. So we were like kind of 90s alternative sort of. And uh, you always took out like a sore thumb because like everything else was heavy metal. And I was like, why is why does everyone love metal so much? Is it pe- are people that angry? Is that what, what it is? You and, know. And was it and during that time? Um, was it like that metal was played at like? Were there more like Polak in? I know the Polak in does a lot of metal. Um, yeah, I think. But, the, but the PI was doing it. Um, but I know a couple I, other places around town did metal, and then you know Scott Street was the blues club. Oh sure, sure. Which I mean, is cool. I like blues. It's like know? a couple years before I left, I learned of the house, the basement show scene in in Wausau. There's oh. like a really like like very very like present basement show scene. Huh. Yeah, like there's a festival. I I can't remember who showed me this. Oh, it was uh, Britton Wildman. You know, it was one of his like yeah. first like you know docu-series that he did um or, or mini doc or whatever that he did and he did it they, they do a, a basement festival somewhere in Wausau and there's like 200 That's people wild. that come to this thing and they just shove them all in a basement and these band these metal bands play wow. yeah there's people like sleeping all over the off all over the the house and... I remember playing a couple basement shows when I was when Bob Allen and I were in a band okay yeah back in the day I probably did with I probably did with my high school band too sure but I don't know. I thought that was. I think that was more like you know your friend getting together with your friends. Not the second one though. The second one was probably more what you're talking about. That's interesting. Right. Yeah. Did I ever tell you my experience with the uh, Washington Square building and the guy living in the basement? I don't think so. No. Please, so, please do. <laughs> so we were. It was. So this was back when. Um, this was back when uh, uh, Gelato Cafe still existed in the Jefferson under the Jefferson ramp. Okay. Yeah, that was kind of the place to hang out. Like. Really. Yeah. I'd never even heard of that. Yeah, it was. It was back in. Um, let me see now. It's probably f- fifteen years ago. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, so that was like the coffee shop. It was right before Alistair Deacons opened. Okay. And in fact, in fact, when Alistair Deacon opens, I would I would use Alistair Deacon's as my study spot. Okay. Because I didn't I would know I wouldn't know anybody there, but like, Gelato's Cafe was like the place I went to to socialize. Because every time I went there, I'd run into somebody I know. And uh, so I was sitting out with a with a group of people. One of them was named Brian, and Brian Brian actually now lives in Milwaukee, but he lived here at the time, and I think he did some commuting back and forth. Well, he starts telling me about this guy that lives in a in the basement under Washington Square, and I was like, "What? That's crazy!" He goes, "No, you guys got to come. Let's let's finish our coffee and come with me." So we so we're walking. We walk with him, and at the time they had these tiles. Um, so he he starts tapping on the tiles, and he finds one that that's hollow, and he taps he he taps on the. This is like a Saturday night. Taps on taps on the one that's hollow, and this guy comes up. What? It's like he's got like long hair and beard. And he's like, "Oh, hey man, what's going on?" So he has like this like recording studio in the basement, but he also has like a bed. Holy cow. So he apparently was living there. What? I want to see this space. He what? started talking about some weird shit, man. I'm sure he did. After a while we're like, "Yeah, um, <laughs> look at the time." Yeah. Um, gee, I yeah, my laundry is. I think I left my laundry in the oven. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta go, go do my taxes, <laughs> wash my hair, feed the pigs. Um, but, yeah, that was that was wild. Like, it was like this kind of like psychedelic studio in the middle of a, in the middle of the basement of Washington Square. So how did you? So wait, you could only get to it through this like hollowed tile. Well, that's how you like alerted him. Oh, and then he'd come so out of a door he, or so something. He, so he came out, you know, and lo- went unlock the doors. 
they, I think they locked it at the time, like at a, after a certain time, because you know they didn't have like jalapenos in there like they do now or anything like that. So. Oh, so where was it? Like where? What? Well, like... it was the part that it was uh, on Washington Street. Okay. On the J.C. Penney Mall, across from the J.C. Penney side of the mall. Okay. You know there was that that little door. That kind of leads across, and if you go across, then it goes to the alley that goes. Oh sure, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like right. It was it was right by that. It was somewhere near that door is where the tile was, and then he came out that door and would let you in. Interesting. Yeah, it was weird. But you never heard of like what how, how what ended up happening? No, I'm super curious. Me too. Because I've been in the basement a few times, and I'm like, I always look around. I'm like, what if that guy's still here, or his stuff is still here? Interesting. Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty random and wild. I love that. Yeah. So what's uh hidden, hidden wasa? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm digging this like uh, this this conversation about you know I just I still really like this place, man. I still really yeah. adore it. I think about it all the time. Do you see, see yourself ever moving back here? I could see that. Yeah. yeah that'd be cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's there's something about this place, man. I talk about it. Um, I still talk about it a lot. And because uh, people always ask, you know, there's there's something here that I don't think a lot of people know about. And right. and and so when you bring it up uh, and you talk about it, you know, as passionately as I do, mm-hmm. um, people are they tend to be curious. OK, tell me more. You know, and you, mm-hmm. you say these things and they're like, you never guess, you know, ne- you never <laughs> know that, you know, and that's that's kind of the whole story. That's the whole identity is, you know, it's kind of like. Who knew? Yeah, see, I gotta, I gotta get you a keep it Wassum T-shirt. Yeah, and then you can wear it around, and be like, yeah. And if you want to learn more about Wassa, yeah, yeah, I still have a closet full of Wassa T-shirts, some of which are one of a kinds. You know, nice. I still have a Wassa flannel that uh, uh, Billy Bronstead gave me. Uh, oh, Billy. It's, it's got it's like the old Wassa insurance, like you know how it was like stacked. It was like just Wassa, like stacked kind of. Oh yeah. He did that on the back of a of a flannel when he was working for some t-shirt company or something and then he gave it to me as like a going away present when i moved yeah, I've, I've, i finally met billy uh last month you didn't know billy before that i never met him oh. no. i know who he, i know the name but yeah yeah actually he's gonna be on the podcast next month great that's yeah. awesome yeah i love that man yeah he's like touring around and stuff he's he's a good soul and i've been keeping up with he's yeah he's been everywhere yeah yeah harold plays with him uh um too you know it's so a harold what project you know, is that God knows. I don't I can't, keep, I can't keep track. Yeah. Harold's always like, yeah, I played with this person and that person. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, it's it's still Billy Billy and, and John, right? John Nepp? I think I that's know. that's that's the loot. That's uh or at least that's what I that's what I thought. I've listened, yeah, I've listened to his, you know, he's got his album out on uh Spotify. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's he's, he's put good. some stuff out there. Mm-hmm. And he's switched up his his sound a little bit, like, you know, I remember um he put out an album called This Bed of Mine that is it's kind of, you know, like it's 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 bluegrassy, it's but it's like ballady too. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's it's very like um I don't know. I, I, I he's got a song on there called My Old Man that was like just it just it just hit me. It's a song about his dad and just really oh, you yeah. just feel that that relationship. Yeah. Um so yeah, he's he's an authentic musician and I'm I'm happy he's doing well. See, and that's what I'm talking about, you know, and I, I didn't mean to you know, bash metal and blues by any means, but there's always a place for it. I just want more variety besides that. Right. And now now I feel like we've got that. Right. Yeah. You know, that's growing. Is Wasa having and you know, not that it's like necessarily my cup of tea right now in this phase of my life, but like does Wasa have any like like rappers or hip hop artists or anything like that? Um, not that I'm aware of. There's not really much of a platform for that, I would imagine. Hmm. I don't think there are any rappers. Well, I was just asking because there were a couple of them that had popped up in Eau Claire. Um, and I know one of them actually, I think he performed at Malarkey's once or twice. Um. That sounds right. Yeah, but, yeah, I don't know, I don't even know what the kids are into nowadays. What are the kids into? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm old, I don't know what's going on. They're all on their Tic Tac and their... Tic Tac? And their chap snat and whatever. <laughs> I don't know. It was, stuff. It was, it was so dad of you to say it I know, that I way. Can't, dude, I can't keep with any of that stuff. I don't even want to keep. When I tur- so I turned 40 last summer. Right. And once I turned 40, I was just like, you know, I don't even want to know what these things are. 
Sure. Like, like you don't, you demonstrate why I need to use this thing. I know as I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to kind of still be in the know a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, I, I tell myself I'm 12 years old with 20 years of experience. And... Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, you're 32, right? I'll, I'll actually be, I'll be 31 next month. 31 so next it's, month. I, I was okay. being a little uh, sensational with the 20 years of experience. Not that much. But... <laughs> yeah, so you're still, you're, you're still in that in-between phase. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'll get to my phase eventually. I'll be like... You know, I still feel like I, I, I hang out, and I've always kind of been this way, I hang out with people. Mm. I don't ever hang out with people my own age. I hang out with mm. people who are older than me or younger than me. And I'm either learning or I teaching, I feel like. I kind of do, too. Mostly because there just aren't that many Gen Xers. We're like the, we're like the smallest generation. Well, I yeah, you guys are so, by volume. Yeah, so rebellious <laughs> and, you know, yeah, just there just weren't that many jaded. There just weren't that many of us. <laughs> yeah, we're, you know, we're still wearing our flannels. and. Right. It's cool now, though. You know? Yeah. Yeah, all that stuff comes back. Right. Yeah, I have a, I have a T-shirt uh, from Mork and, Mork and Mindy. Okay. With you know Robin Williams going nanu nanu. Oh yeah. And uh, this young gal at the coffee shop is like, oh my god, I love your shirt. And I was like, well, I was old enough to actually see it when it was on. Well, not actually, I would have been like two, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it would have been in the background when I was actually alive. And it's funny what they, yeah, it's funny like um, you know, because now eighties nostalgia is really kind of a thing now. Right. Yeah. And so, so you have all these millennials or even like pre millennials. Gen Z. Gen Z, yeah. See, they're like, oh, man, the 80s must have been awesome. Like, yeah, well, it wasn't all Stranger Things. Right, right. You know, it wasn't all magic. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, I was telling you when we sat down here that I'm. Um, this is going to be uh, a beneficial experience, not only just to have a conversation with you in a place I've never been in, in a, in a community that I, that I still really, really uh, hold to a high regard, um, but I'm starting a couple of my own podcasts. Yeah. And I've never done that before. But I've I did a bunch of radio you know, talk show hosting um, through my sports journalism days. Um, so I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm a avid podcast listener. Um, uh, I try to listen to as much as I can, different varieties, things like that. So I'm very eager to like, you know, have these conversations. Um, and so I kind of want to try it out. Uh, what that may feel like with you, if you're okay with that. <laughs> you're going to flip this around? Well, Shoot. you know, I, I don't consider it, you know, to me, I just want to have like a conversation. Like, sure. So, you know, it kind of depends on the guests, like how much I, I interview versus, uh, I keep hitting the mic, um, versus just, you know, talk and shoot the shoot the breeze. And, sure. Um, so, yeah, we can, you can flip it around. Do you want to ask me things? Yeah, well, honestly, you know, you, we, you talked a little bit about um, – you know, that you were patting me on the back for some of the things that I had done in this community. But what about you, man? Like, <laughs> me, yeah. you have been, you're you're an OG in Wausau, OG. right? Uh, you've seen it go through its trials, tribulations, evolutions, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the highs, the lows. Um, you've got a really unique perspective on, on, on Wausau. And you also have proven to be kind of fearless in the sense of just, I want to do this. And so I'm going to do it, whether it's, you know, bike fun wasa or the podcast or, or, or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. So what was the impetus behind the podcast? I know you had, it started with at, at dailies, um, but kind of yeah. when did the idea come to you that you wanted to do a podcast? When did it become more than less of an idea and more of a, okay, mm-hmm. this is something I'm going to do. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Cause I'm actually kind of, a late comer to podcasts, I think. Sure. And I think I think Joe Rogan, and we've talked about this. I think mm-hmm. Joe Rogan was kind of my first podcast that I really got into. And once I started listening to him, you know, I started discovering some other ones. But I've always come back to, like, I always decided if I ever wanted to have a podcast, I wanted it to be like his because I really like that open ended conversation. You know, I didn't, I don't like, I, I feel like it's, I think it's easier to absorb the information. Um, when you when someone is giving it in long form versus like, you know, like an edited like a radio lab type of a podcast, like I really don't like that kind that kind very much. Um, the only exception is uh, the Freakonomics one. I really yeah, I really enjoy one. theirs. But even then, like it's it can be hard to. It, it kind of feels like blink and you miss it, you know. Sure. Whereas when you sit down and just have like a normal conversation where it's not so structured. I feel like you have more space so that if your attention wanders for a second, you don't completely miss some really vital fact. Right. Um, but really what, what happened, the reason why I thought I should start a podcast 
is because I would go to these, I would have these interviews, and this was after I started listening to them myself. I would go to an interview and, you know, Dr. Linda Bluestein was a great example. You know, I went to talk to her about her clinic. You know, we probably talked for about 10 minutes about stuff that was relevant for the story, but we talked for like an hour and a half. And, you know, I have a bunch of these. Holly Ann Reif, uh, Reif was another one um, where, you know, we just had these great long conversations. And I would think, I would think, God, I just did a podcast. Mm-hmm. All you had to do is record it. Right. It, kind of that simple, kind of not. <laughs> sure, yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of technical stuff to figure out. Um, it can be, well, it can be, it can be as simple and as complicated as you want. Like right now, this is more complicated than I could probably set up on my own. Sure. Although I was kind of looking into the setup today and, you know, I could, I could probably possibly do that. Logic is a little more complicated than like, but there's a, you know, there's Audacity, which is free online. Yeah. Um, it's pretty much plug and play. You know, I was using a Blue, Met, Blue Yeti microphone that's, you know, about 160 bucks, I think. Sure. And uh, it plugs in. You hit record. You start talking. Right. And so you were you were recording through Audacity. Yeah. Okay. Is yeah. this Audacity he's using now? No. No, he's using Logic, which okay. uh, I had to I had to figure out last weekend because sure. he was out of town. And uh, do you do it's like a little more complicated? But I think I figured it out. Do you go through and listen to it all and like you know, any any sort of editing or? I don't do any editing. Um, I, just I, I raw. Take the, I take the Joe Rogan approach of like, you know, if we're gonna start it, we're gonna talk, and we're gonna stop, and. I've never had a, I haven't had a situation where someone said something and was like, "Oh my God, you got to edit that out, please, please, please." You know, it just hasn't happened yet. Sure. And well, I guess if it really someone really like, you know, if they said something they weren't supposed to, that would get them in trouble at work or whatever. I guess I would, but right. You know, it hasn't come up it hasn't come up so far yet. But uh, yeah, so I started uh, I, the very first one was at uh, Daly's restaurant. Right. Um, I talked to talked to Jim Daly and said, "Hey, would you?" sponsor the podcast by you know letting us host it there and then you would provide us with drinks which is my current deal with whitewater as well okay and uh he was he was all for it and that was funny because he'd always come in like halfway through the podcast yeah i remember those episodes it was so funny <laughs> i listened to a few of those episodes one with like uh what gunning and gunning, and, yeah. and morty your episode morty with morty was good, was good. that was great wasn't yeah it? I, well i like my gunning one too yeah both of those were good I think Gunning was the. I think he had the record for longest. Yeah, he at one point had brought in his 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 like robotic dog or whatever, right? Yeah, and I wish I had video of that one. So video was like I I thought like I should do I should put I should put a video out of this too. But how would I do it? Well, um, so f- at first you could live stream, but I find my phone would die because I had an older one. Now sure. I've got a newer one that works better. And then so I tried to record it, but I didn't have a lot of space, so I could only record like 20 minutes. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just say the heck with it. And then YouTube, and then YouTube made it so you can only uh, you can only live stream if you have a thousand or more followers. Okay. So I was like, well, damn, dang, man. <laughs> well, then I found out there's an app called Streamlabs okay. that lets you bypass that, so you can hook up you can hook up either YouTube or Twitch. And it'll like stream it through there and then it goes right to YouTube. So I have been doing live streaming and now that I got Harold, now that Harold came along and he wanted to get involved, I'm like, you know, so he's doing, multi, this is our first multi camera episode. Yeah. So we got three cameras exciting. set up, four cam, three. He's got this iPad going now. Yeah. I don't know what he's doing with that. We didn't talk about that. So well, I see. Where did he disappear to? Does he just come uh, think, and go? Uh, I, th- he, I think he went to Target to get a space heater. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, f- I think he he says he gets really cold in here. Yeah, you can see. Are you that. cold? No, I'm good. I'm pretty good. This is a good space, though. So so you so you you got Jim to agree, Jim Daly to agree to do the podcast, and then uh-huh. it's 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 obviously evolved a bit since then. Uh, did you what what did yeah, you fi- so, figure out didn't work, and or I, I'm going to try this idea? Just take me through the whole process. Well, it was it was interesting because uh, it went pretty strong. Um, I had. I have Brad Carger on and kind of did a joint thing because I was doing his retirement story. So I kind of did his interview oh. um, as part of the podcast wow. and then, then used it as the basis for the story. Look at you. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting <laughs> idea. Yeah, that was great. Um, Carger was a fun episode. He's he's a good guy. And uh, and then after that one, then I got really busy and I didn't have a guest for a couple months. And then I was like, yeah, I got to get the I got to get the podcast going again. And then, and then dailies announced that they were closing. So I was like, dang it! Yeah, 
But then I realized the foibles of calling it live at Daly's, because if Daly's no longer exists, the name doesn't really make a lot of sense. <laughs> right. right. Especially if I was going to host it somewhere else. So, well, yeah. you know, Whitewater was here, and right. you know, it's, I was talking with, uh, actually, it was Leslie I was talking with at first, and then, you know, I talked to little Kelly too later, but I said, hey, what would you think if I hosted the podcast here? And She's like, yeah, let's look around. And then they were showing you with the green room work. And so so for a while, I was recording in, in the green room upstairs, which literally is green. Okay. Like a, like a pink light or like a light mint green. And uh, I think I remember that room before when I've been in this building before. So I, I decided to call it Keep It Wassum. And uh, and uh, so that's so that if I ever had to move again, <laughs> I wouldn't have to change the name again, which is an enormous pain in the ass, by the way. Really? It's, yeah. Did you, did you have well, to the biggest like... pain is the logo because it didn't. I, I think it still hasn't fully taken in iTunes. Oh. So like once in a while, depending on if I go to the shows page, the Live at Daily's logo still shows up. But if you download, if you have it, if you're subscribed to it in iTunes, and uh, an episode downloads, then the right logo, the Keep It Awesome logo, is there. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. As far as like things I've learned. Um, well, it really helps um, having Harold. It helps having Harold because if I'm not worried about the technical side of it, it lets me like be more present with the guest. Yeah. And I, uh, a few times when I was fiddling around and trying to get the live streaming to work, I felt bad because the guest was talking and I was kind of paying attention, but also trying to like go, oh, why isn't this working? Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that's that's definitely something that having having him doing that, having someone separate like starting it. Uh, that makes a big difference. Sure, I, think. Um, I bet. Yeah, I mean, having yeah. an extra set of hands is always helpful. It is. It's not. I guess without the video, like the audio part's pretty simple. The sure. video is where it gets a little more complicated, and then you got to think of like, you know, what your space looks like, your audio, your, your setup. Otherwise, uh, I think I think if you just do the audio part, it's the audio part. I, I always thought was pretty pretty simple, or at least it can be. Sure. Obviously, what Harold's doing with the multi mic system and the preamp and everything is. It sounds like a million times better. Sure. Um, but I never thought it was bad particularly. No, I mean, it was good. I loved the rawness of it, honestly. Yeah. You know, especially yeah. when you had Jim walking into the middle of interviews. and I miss that, yeah. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. Kelly and Leslie never come in here. <laughs> so um, what can you, like, recall some of your favorite uh, conversations or um, maybe even, like, mm-hmm most surprising things learned or funniest things said on the podcast thus far? You know, the one that, uh, the one that really surprised me and it was the one, it was one of the ones that I really wished I had video. In fact, I might have Brian Gunning come back on. It was in Brian Gunning. All of a sudden, he didn't tell me he was going to do this. All of a sudden he starts opening this bo- these boxes and pulling, he's pulling out these robots. And I was like, did you, uh, I'm like, I'm like, did you just bring, did, did you, did you build a robot? <laughs> he's like, I did. And it was like this, there was like one of those moments like, did you make a robot? I remember that episode. That was so, <laughs> that's such a fun episode. Yeah. You know, and the other, the, um, the other really fun one was with, uh, Mindy and Lane from Siren Shrubs. Okay. So Lane, Lane Cozzolino was the, uh, the executive director of Farm Shed. Okay. And she and her friend Mindy started this like shrub company. So shrub is like a sipping vinegar that takes back to like the colonial era that's it's kind of making a comeback now. And it's really it makes really good cocktails. It also makes really good mocktails. So if you you know if you're gonna be a designated uh driver mm-hmm. that's a or you know you just don't drink for whatever reason you can still kind of participate in yeah. And they were just so funny. We just like they were, they we just laughed and joked and had a good time. We, I somehow somehow we we created this uh, boom flavor meme that we kept repeating. You know, so every time someone would say something funny, we'd be like boom flavor. <laughs> that was actually the most. Uh, that's been the most popular episode to date. Like really, yeah, it's gotten like 160 views on YouTube and nice. Yeah, that one that one was probably one of the the best ones yet. You know, is, are there other podcasts in in Wasa? Do people, other people do podcasts. Uh, Dino Carvino has. Oh, that's one. right. I've yeah. been on that podcast. You've been on it. That was one podcast <laughs> where I had to say, Dino, we we're going to add that part out. Yeah, he he beat you up a little. He put he, he pushed me. He pushed, he pushed me a little, you a little bit. Yeah. yeah, he did not tell me he was going to do that, but. Yeah, I've actually been on a couple times. 
The funny thing is I haven't even listened to the episodes I've been on. It was once to talk about Komari, um, the whole Komari thing, because I was doing like a Komari project on Marie Kondo, a project on my house. And then the second one was... Uh, uh, the second one was about uh, bic- he wanted me to have me on about bicycling. Okay. Yeah. Actually, he was pretty. I was kind of. I kind of had that in the back of my mind when I went on, but but you know, he was he was pretty cool both on both of them. Cool. So now he hasn't had me back on, so I don't know. Maybe I pissed him off. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Um, but other than that, I don't know of any other. One. Oh, um, Ben Lee. Ben, do you know Ben Lee? Yeah, it's um. Him and Tiffany. Tiffany, yeah, Rodriguez. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think they have, they either have or had a podcast. I can't remember what they told me the last time they, um, last time we talked about it. But I know there were we were gonna we were gonna go on each other's podcast to kind of cross promote. But other than those two, I, I haven't really come across any. Sure. Mm-hmm. And had you most of your guests that you've had, have you had conversations with those people beforehand? Like, I mean, obviously you and I used to talk like all the time, like on yeah. a daily basis. Yeah, that's a good question. I think almost all of them have. I'm trying to think. Let's see, Parker. I'm trying to go back through Ryan and Allie. I don't, I don't know that I've had any, you know, yeah, even Michelle, she was a former coworker. We hadn't talked in a while, so well, I, I interviewed her last summer for about the urban app, recycling app. Boy, I'm trying to think. I think, yeah, I think just about all of them I've had long conversations with. I mean, that's basically how I've my my whole thing was like. When I have really great conversations with someone in an interview, it's like, oh, I'll just that would make a great podcast, right? And then I'll have them on or. You know, and some people, it's just people I've known. Um, oh, uh, Harold, uh, actually Harold and Matt. You know, I, I didn't know Harold at all when he came on. Oh, really? Yeah. And now and he's your producer. Now he's my producer. And fact checker, right? And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. I actually want him to get a mic so he can be like my Jamie and yeah, yeah, yeah. look things up. But yeah. he always he has to run out to Target to get things, so. He yeah. just picks the podcast recording time to go do his target errands. Or what? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> doing the laundry. I don't know. Do you? So you listen? Do you still listen to the Ro- Joe Rogan Experience? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, do you listen to any other like long form, like kind of raw? Yeah, I like a lot of comedy ones actually. Um, like Pete Holmes has a great one um, called "You Made It Weird." Okay. And that, that, that's he's actually kind of where I got the "Keep It Awesome." label because he tells people at the end to keep it crispy uh okay and so i was like keep it awesome that's gonna be my title nice but he didn't title his podcast so i didn't totally steal it the p holmes uh actually p holmes plays in appleton a lot okay he's a comedian from california that sounds familiar he's uh he's he's pretty good friends with uh uh aaron Rodgers actually he had Aaron Rodgers on the podcast on his podcast oh nice i was like this is, i listened to the, uh, that was one of my favorite episodes it's a good get yeah and uh and uh, Fighter and the Kid with Brendan Schaub and Brian Callen. That's I don't know that one either. That's a really funny one. I listened to uh, the only really long form kind of like raw conversation like podcast I listen to is well consistently because I listen to the Joe Rogan Experience on occasion when they've got he's got an interesting guest. Um, is uh, the one I listen to is the Armchair Expert with Dax Shepard. Oh, I've heard of that. I haven't checked yeah. it out. I really enjoy it like he is a really good um just authentic like interviewer and he's not this i mean it's it's there's i mean there's questions that you know he there's conversations that he wants to have he kind of goes in i would imagine with some sort of direction um Mm -hmm. but it's very like open and so and i'm pretty sure there's i mean it's i don't think it's it's raw so it it's edited um but yeah he's I, di- I didn't really I don't really like him much as an actor and a comedian but as a podcast host man he he's really vulnerable on you know during the interviews and like shares you know you know really difficult parts about his life and how he can relate to who is um, who his guest is he and the relationship or the dynamic between him and his producer um, is really good as well and he has some really interesting guests on like uh, I re- do you know Adam Grant? Adam Grant's an oh, organizational yeah. psychologist. Yeah, got I, read, I, read author, of, I read one of his books. Give and Take. Um, i trying to think of what other books he's got. And then Malcolm Gladwell. You know yeah. Malcolm Gladwell? Like yep. Blink and Tipping Points. And, I read um, one of his too. You know, I think. Yeah. 
And on that podcast was when I learned like the connection between Adam Grant and Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell. And it's like essentially we as a society have Adam Grant, his brain, because of Malcolm Gladwell. Like mm. Malcolm Gladwell like inspired him. And then all of a sudden I get turned on to – Malcolm Gladwell's uh, podcast, Revisionist History, and then Adam Grant has a podcast called Work Life. And on one of Adam Grant's uh, episodes, Work Life's episodes, uh, it's a live de like intellectual debate between him and Malcolm Gladwell. It was awesome, man. I highly recommend that podcast. They talk about all kinds of crazy, like just deep level, like underneath the surface layer, or like uh, mm -hmm. conversations. And they really... Like they, they're both very um, smart, obviously, um, and both very. Well, I would say Adam's probably a bit more stubborn in his beliefs mm -hmm. than Malcolm is, um, and so he would tell Mike Malcolm at the very beginning of the interview or the debate, um, like my 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 point here is to win every one of these arguments. <laughs> <laughs> and so Malcolm would just never, when, when, when Adam would like dig his heels in, Malcolm would just like, okay, whatever, you know, we're going to, we're going to leave it there or whatever, but just such good conversation. So, so that, uh, the armchair experts got me turned on to so many uh, different guests that I probably wouldn't have never uh, have learned about. Like he had one with, um, with uh, Monica Lewinsky and she gives a really like authentic, you know, kind of raw, but very articulate, uh -huh like reflection of the whole, you know, the Clinton scandal and all of that. Interesting. Um, yeah. It's just, he, he's interviewed, he interviews like entrepreneurs, but also like artists and musicians and actors. And, um, he had a real good interview with Drew Carey. I hadn't heard it from Drew Carey in a long time. Obviously I don't watch Price is Right anymore, but, right. um, yeah, yeah. You might, you might like the Pete Holmes one too. Cause he has a lot of great, um, he has a lot of great guests on too. Um, a lot of, a lot of people in the, uh, a lot of people in the entertainment industry, but um, he had a really good one with, and he always, what I like about him is that he always goes into the spiritual realm. Oh, cool. And he comes from kind of a Christian background, but also like, I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's like, it's like an intellectual Christian background. And then he has, he had um, uh, the guy who plays Dwight on the office on oh yeah I that guy's really interesting i would imagine he probably is he's like in this weird religion called the basai or something like that i'd never heard of it before and uh they were they were talking about that it was really interesting but um yeah what was the other one yeah well the the other one i've been kind of into lately is called um it's called the office ladies and it's okay it's uh jenna fisher and angela kearney from or kinney from from the office and they like break down each episode really but what's really cool is like you get all these insights into how like tv shows are produced from what you know they're kind of they kind of explain like how how each episode is put together and all the things that went on behind the scenes and um i find that stuff really fascinating just from having worked with jared on some of his film sure. projects and yeah. seeing what it works looks like just on his level and then to imagine like an actual tv show like i guess with the office especially for the first season they it was shot in like an actual office building, you know, not a set. Sure. But like an actual building to give the authentic authenticity of having like a documentary crew, like filming this, you know, filming, filming an office environment. And like, yeah, there's like even this like incident about like, there was that one, I don't know if, have you watched a lot of The Office? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I've probably seen every episode. Yeah. There's a, there's that episode where Dwight, uh, Jim tricks Dwight into hiding in this box in the warehouse. Oh yeah. Well, they had to, the, the produce, the, the props guy like had to call around to find people who had this box and he couldn't find anybody that had the box. And he finally found someone that like rushed, you know, that would rush like the production of these boxes and like kind of delay one of the orders so they could go because he needed like a hundred of the, he ordered like a hundred of these things, you know, because they were going to go through them over and over and over to go take, mm -hmm. take after take. And, you know, just those little details are really fascinating to me and how this stuff is put together. Yeah. Cause you, it's, it, yeah, you, you don't see it. Like what you yeah. see is like the finished product. There's so much going on. Yeah. And like this, I mean, this is, we're basically producing a TV show now. Right. I mean, you know, and it's, it's, uh, I found out, you know, someone, cause like someone early on said, oh, you should do it where you have like, you know, multiple cameras and you're zooming down on people. I'm like, you want me to do that by myself? Like, I can barely get the regular video up. Right. Like, do you know how much that goes into that? Like, right. And now, now I got this guy that can do it. So, you know, it's it's different. But so I'm excited about that because I, I think that's really neat. But, yeah. Well, this is the type of thing that I'm hoping to um, – that gets started in, in Sheboygan, actually. So 
one of the things I'm focused on there is helping the colleges there um, mm -hmm. establish student-run business programs. And so you have these companies that um, are ran by students, like the president of the company is a student, um, and it's, it's, it's kind of venture-backed or whatever, so there's money to, to get it going. Um, and then they they do real business with other real businesses that aren't ran by students. Dude, it's kind of cool that um, they're kind of doing that at Everest a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and it was kind of neat because they're like, there's like, a, like the students run the vending machines, and then there's students that are creating products for the vending machines. Oh, nice. So they're like, you know, they're actually doing business together. That's awesome. I'm like, that's really cool. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so like, well, I, I'm just kind of like canvassing the, the, the business market in Sheboygan trying to find, um, you know, opportunities to start new businesses, you know, gaps in the market, you know, where are people currently getting products or services elsewhere um, that when that could be filled by one of these new businesses, obviously you'd want to start a student run business in a pretty fertile uh, market for that business. Uh, you want them to have a good experience and not fail uh, and have, leave a sour taste in their mouth about entrepreneurship. Um, right. But one of these companies that we're, we're hoping to start is a media company, because as mm -hmm. I was saying earlier, there, it's kind of a desert there that, that really relies on, you know, Green Bay and Milwaukee's television markets. And then, you know, you know better than anyone in terms of print media, how stretched thin you are. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a Gannett paper there, but the reporters have to cover like four or five counties, you know, it's just, yeah. so there's a lot of stuff that kind of falls through, through the cracks. And so, um, the idea is, and I actually, this is actually something I pitched uh, to, to city council. Like one of the last projects I pitched in Wausau was uh, the creation of like a, like kind of a Netflix slash YouTube um, like media online media source where you have uh, a team of people producing um, like the Netflix original programs. You know, Netflix has its own original content, but then it sources content from other producers. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a team of people. Uh, and I was actually working with Morty on this um, and Brenton Wildman and um, and we were going to produce uh, like regularly scheduled like podcasts, TV shows, um, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And then uh, it would live on the mm -hmm. same online platform and then other people could produce their own stuff too, like a YouTube, like it was an open source thing. So we're hoping to create that in Sheboygan using students producing like the original uh, programming. Um, and then I hope there will be like kind of a, um, kind of a surfacing of a, of, a, of a media platform that will host podcasts and pictorials and, you know, and documentary series and things like that. We'll see where it goes. But I'm nice. hoping to be able to, like, teach podcasting to people, mm -hmm. even though I've not done it myself. Well, that was, uh, that was one of the pie-in-the-sky pie ideas I had for this place, is that eventually, once we get the production down and get everything solid, like... You know, that's something maybe one day this turns into Watson Productions and it's like, if you want to come record your podcast, you know, obviously you don't want to buy all this stuff and try to figure it out. Just right. come here. We'll, right. we'll do it for you. Yeah, I dig it. You know, you just have to get the, the you know, the scaling right of, you know, how much it would cost and how you would, you know, who's, who's how, you know, make sure that you have the time to do it. But and then I thought, you know, and I, I plan to use this like now I have this backdrop so I can do I can do photography here. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of possibilities. Yeah. I think, you know, you said earlier you relate to the podcasting game, but I, it's, it's here to stay, man. Like, yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. No, I just think it's funny. Like people have been listening to podcasts forever and I'm like, I, I think it was only like four or five years ago that I, I've like really started getting into them. Sure. Well, and that's, I mean, you were mm -hmm. kind of, I think that's where you really meant started. As, I meant as a listener. Like, sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And I think that's really when it kind of, you know, started to really pick up in terms of people accepting it as a, um, you know, like a, a legitimate form of like media consumption. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden, you know, now there's podcasts about everything. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing is that I've heard Joe Rogan say a lot that like, we don't have a Walter Cronkite anymore. I was kind of like, dude, it's you. Right. You're the Walter Cronkite. Right. Like people from both sides listen to you. Like everyone listens to you. And they listen to you because you don't have a side. I mean, you're pretty open about the fact that you're liberal-ish, but you still like guns, you like hunting. You appeal to so many people. I'm right. like, Joe, you're the guy. Yep. Like, if I was ever on the Joe Rogan podcast, I'd be like, you're the new Walter Cronkite. Right, right. Because this is the new medium. Right. You know? Yep. Just like just like radio is the new medium for Walter. Did you know he was a, uh, a, a print newspaper reporter? I don't. 
I think that sounds a war, familiar. A war correspondent. Okay. Yeah, he he worked for API. You know, one of the one of the wire services, mm-hmm. like just like Associated Press, um, in World War Two. Like that dude was a hardcore like print journalist. Like he was the real deal. Dang. I didn't even know that. You know, my dad my dad lent me this book on Walter Cronkite, and I was like, oh, you know, he's a journalist. It'd be interesting. And I had no idea. I was like, oh my god, this guy's awesome. Yeah, yeah. What a legend. Mm-hmm. What a legend. Well, I'm curious to see what uh, what this podcast, I mean, this whole innovation district. I'm, I'm. It'll be I'm, fun, I'm, man. I'm fascinated. Like you guys got to bring that. We got to bring that here too. Yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, there was. I don't know exactly who, who I was talking to, but someone told me, what, you know, in regard to the mall, like that being kind of a concept that um, that would be, you know, a viable or at least, you know, a a, a way to kind of bring business into this, you know, because you've got some of these companies in Wausau that are heavy hitters in the market, you know, the Green Hex mm-hmm. and Wausau Window and Wall and Crystal Finishing. And, right. you know, right now I would imagine a lot of their business operations are kind of siloed, as they should be. But if you had an opportunity for those companies to kind of mm-hmm. bump into each other, you know, in a space, maybe they're not moving operations here, but they have some sort of like satellite office mm-hmm. or something and you infuse students in there and, 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 you right. see what happens, you know. Well, I think, it'd, yeah, I think it'd be cool. We got to like bring all this stuff together. We can't have these little silos, like, you know, you got you got the entrepreneurial center way out in the industrial park. You got McDevco on the north side of town. Mm-hmm. You know, put them all in the center. Let's get the we got the arts. We got Whitewater here with the arts. Let's let's make them all in one place, one stop shop. You know? Right. Remember a when di- I was one, a district. Remember when I was trying to? Uh, it was interesting because I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about coming up here, and I was like. Um, and how, when I was, I was like my last few months at McDevco, I was trying to, um, convince the powers that be that, uh, that we should buy the YWCA building and make that building, like move the chamber there, move the EDC there, move the EEC there, um, SBDC score, put all your entrepreneurial like support you know, yeah. in one building and then turn one of the floors into a co-working space. And so it's like, it's like the Walmart of entrepreneurship. And then I had even a vision like around the building, putting up like pictures of like the entrepreneurs that kind of like the Wasa group, you know, that kind of formed mm-hmm. this whole community um, as inspiration, you know, uh, obviously it didn't work out. I don't know. What, whatever happened to the YWCA? Who owns it now? Oh, the Hostler. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Holster. Excuse me. Holster. Holster. The Holster group bought it. And they're still letting the YW operate out of there. Um, the Cross Church. Oh, so Yao got his stuff over there now. It's cool. Yeah, although he, there might be some uh, movement going on there. Uh, nothing I can talk about publicly. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> there may be, uh, there may be some opportunities for Yao and his group, and that's where the Joseph Project is. Oh, nice. Yeah. Done. Um, I've been volunteering with that. Awesome. Last couple of times. I'm uh, super glad that's still going on. I remember. Yeah. That was a uh, Chris Zeman, a yeah. medical college student. Mm-hmm. That was his like kind of. Uh, what do they call it? The pa- uh, community uh, scholarly positions in the community. Yeah, 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 that type yeah. of thing. Yep. Uh, that was a really cool project. They're doing that in Sheboygan. There's a Joseph oh, project program in Sheboygan good. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Yao, Yao Yang pretty much took that over and go for him. He's the man. He know? is a man. You know, it's so funny because uh, you know I've inter- I interviewed him a couple times and he's always so like like so like positive and like incredibly um, humble. Like super. You know, it seems he seems kind of mellow, but then like. He goes in front of them, and it's like, it's like it's like the tough love prison talk. Like, oh really? Like, oh yeah. He's like he's like, you need to be on time. There is no excuses. He's and a he's military like, oh, guy, man. Yeah, no, he's hardcore. Yeah, he gets when he gets into it. He's like, I was like, damn, I'm a little afraid. <laughs> yeah, he. I re- I remember his. Uh, I'd never really seen him in action, but he was he was one of the pitches at Soup Three. Yeah, he won Soup Three. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that, he just was, he, you know, he just grabbed the crowd of the story of, um, you know, being overseas and, mm-hmm. you know, people that he had bunked with or whatever, just, you know, seeing them die. And you know, it was really rough where he's kind of gave himself to his, the cause. And, yeah. oh, it's really carried him through. I'm super happy things are still going so well for, for the cross. Dude, that guy's a saint, I swear. Yeah. Saint Yang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, he's one of the guys I still got to have on at some point. Maybe I'll maybe I'll have him come on next month. 
Yeah. yeah, he'd be a good one. You should have. Uh, I'm gonna just give you a list of people. I I would I would listen yeah. to these podcasts. Uh, Send them along. Uh, Blake from the River District. Oh yeah, should why have Blake I, on. Why haven't I had Blake on? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, uh, River District is one of our sponsors now. Oh really? Yep. Nice. So you most likely will have heard the ad because <laughs> we'll be reading that later, but you'll have heard it already. So okay. Okay. Cool. Back to the future. Nice. Yeah. You know, Blake would be a great one. Yeah. You should have Tyler on too. Yeah, he's been on my list. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you should have Tyler and Tony at the same time. <laughs> the other bar, the bartender. Oh, the other bartender. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or Tyler and Sam. I don't know. Um, who else? Who else? Uh, uh, it'd be fun to have uh, Tipple on. Oh, Tipple would be fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Scott Wright. Scott or Wright. Sean Wright, excuse me, Sean Wright. Oh yeah, the Sean grand. Wright. Yeah, be, he'd be fun. Yeah, talk about talk about music. Yeah, I mean he sees a ton of music. Uh, who else? You had David Hummer. That was a good conversation. That was a good conversation. Thanks. Uh, Trying to think. Do you have like a like a pool of uh, or a list of people that you or you just does this just kind of come up randomly? I've been. I, I got to get better, but I should really make like a list list. But um, it's kind of like whoever to, once I you know. I try to plan like two or three a month, especially now that we're, you know, renting the space. So we're trying to like, you know, make enough to pay the rent and such. Sure. But, um, but it had been kind of like whoever, however happens to occur to me at the time. Right. And I have like kind of a list in my head, but it's, you know, not written out. Loose. Yeah. I should, I should really like, I did, I wrote a list in the beginning and then you know, I've kind of forgotten about it. Like there's a few, like Gal was one of the people that's been on the list forever. I'm like, oh, I got to get him in. And then I forget about it. Um, these artists, have you ever, dri- you've driven out to the, um, the Motorama, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you've, you've passed that house with all the crazy sculptures. Uh-huh. That couple is super fascinating. I bet. Yeah. I had a great conversation with them and I, I really want to have them on. So eventually we're going to have a couch, not a chair so that we can have more than one guest. Nice. Yeah. That's what we had up, up at the green room. So nice. You said you're having Billy on. Billy's yeah, well, booked. Harold's gonna talk to him uh, tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I actually introduced myself at the Substyle show. I, I saw him and I was like, oh, I gotta get it. So I, you know, I introduced myself. Said, hey, I'm Brian. I, I work with Harold, and you know, we're gonna we have the podcast, and it'd be awesome to have you on sometime. Yeah, he seemed pretty enthusiastic, and you know, Harold plays with projects with them. Yeah, what hey, what's that project called? He was telling me about you guys play together. Uh, uh, Billy Brown's been the loop. Oh, so you're you're a member of the loot. Mm-hmm. So I, I okay. So we were talking about that because I knew it was him and John, but you're in there too. Yeah, and then uh, right now he's the bass player for Substyle, filling in too. Okay, cool. Both now. Nice, that's awesome. What, yeah. what, 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 where is Billy around Wasa still? Yeah. Or is he living in Tomahawk or? He moved back three months ago. Okay. Hmm. So he's living now. Cool. Mm-hmm. I hope to run into him tonight or tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, Harold plays like he practices like three hours a day. Yeah, and then like, you're a pretty he, amazing musician, man. People talk about you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and he learned <laughs> one of the things you should yeah you should listen to the podcast because his he has a pretty cool story. But he was like to, to learn to learn guitar. He like just started practicing like eight hours a day and like shut himself off from the world. It's pretty crazy. Well, sometimes that's what it takes. Yeah, yeah. You should you should listen to their podcast. It's pretty good. I'm going to yeah. It's yeah. Uh, it's probably going to be my. Some listening for my drive back to Milwaukee. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the Katie, the Katie and Bob one. Yeah, I was released. listening. I was listening to the. I was listening to one of those episodes on the way up here. Um, it's funny hearing Melky, you know, just reminisce about his days. Um, <laughs> what drinking beer and smashing pumpkins? Yeah. Like. I know. <laughs> well, it was great when he. Um, it was great when he opened up and like didn't get into like politician mode sure but you know he kind of slipped you had to reel him back a couple of times you noticed he slipped into it a couple sure yeah i was like "Mm." but it's fine it worked it all worked out so right yeah and that and the episode with katie is on my on my docket for the drive back too i think i can get two episodes in on my drive back but uh yeah i enjoyed i enjoyed sitting down with with both of them really i mean i think we had good conversations yeah Mm -hmm. well it's it's like you had kind of opened it up it's like yeah, th- this is what it's going to, you know, there should be a platform to be able to l- know what it's like to have a beer with, uh, you know, uh, a future or, you know, incumbent mayor. 
Um, and that's kind of how you, at least with the milky conversation, that's how you kind of kept it, you know? Yeah. It was kind of funny. It was kind of funny with, uh, I don't think Tammy quite got it at first. Cause she was like, well, isn't this going to conflict with your stories at city pages? I'm like, sure. well, it's totally different. We're not going to talk about policy. Mm. So then she was like, well, why have them on? I'm like, well, they're people. You know? Right. Right. Like people are interesting just because they're people. Like, right. Like, I want to find out what makes them tick just as people, not, you know, from, I don't want to talk about the administrator issue or, you know, uh, should the city have a strategic plan or oh, that's all stuff that we right. can talk about on in city pages. But this right. is more like, what are they like a person? Yeah. As a person, like with Katie, so you didn't hear the Katie one yet, but with Katie, we talked about um, her new Peloton for like 20, 10 minutes. Oh, so, really? Yeah. She's, she's kind of obsessed with it. So <laughs> nice. All but yeah. I mean, it's like, that's the whole idea. I, I feel like with the podcast, like I just want, because like if I interviewed someone, like I'm gathering things for the story, but I feel like this allows me to show like this is what this person is like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the big, well, and the big thing. Especially with you know elected officials, like that's a huge piece. Like people mm-hmm. should know what they're like off of you know the council stand or you know out of a county board meeting or whatever it may be because that's why they're, I mean that's who they are as people. They're not you know alderman or mayor or supervisor or what i mean they are that's a that's a role that they play but for some people for most people like that's how they know them you know yeah and i think it has a, i think it had value too because you know it's really easy to like go oh they're the mayor i can just beat up on them right and you know it's part of democracy you beat up on the title you part know? of democracy is yeah we we criticize and you know that's the way it works but again i mean they are people at the end of the day and it's like I want I wanted to be able to show them like these these are actual real people and not just you know not just titles that you can punch up on I mean right so I guess I I, I hope it I hope it helped and I hope it worked and gave people a sense of that yeah it'll be uh, I don't know it'll be I'm 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 eager to see mm-hmm. uh, how how it turns out that that race uh, not to you know get into politics but. Um, mm-hmm. It, it, I'm eager to see how that how that turns out. Tammy had an interesting observation. She said, "Like, like this is one of those probably the strong strongest race we've had for mayor. Like, like this really is neck and neck and hard to hard to know who's going to come out on top." Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember it being like, I mean, I, I was I actually dust dusted off the the videography skills during the last mayoral. Uh, election in Wausau in 2016. Channel Nine called me up to oh, yeah. to go set up camp at at Melky's uh, at Melky's like campaign spot, and that was it was mm-hmm. it was him and Jay, Jay Cronenwetter, right? Yep. Yeah, and that was a pretty close race, I think. It was pretty close, yeah. Yeah, I think Melky won. God, I don't remember what the percentages were. I can't remember either. I've learned uh, I've learned not to make predictions. Oh yeah, well. Yeah, other than uh, Trish Sunker, Laura, and Stale, I like, thought that was a pretty easy one to pick. But right, right. Since, uh, since Lawrence, his Facebook page uh, had like twenty three likes, which shows me he didn't put a lot of time into it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, I hope you uh, hope you learned a ton about about podcasting. Today. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is gonna be great. I'm really looking <laughs> forward to my own. Uh, well, hey, it was great having you on. Uh, how Thanks would, for having me. Yeah, am for I, sure. And I, I felt like I was um, uncredentialed to be here because I'm I don't I'm not a, a Wassonian. Anymore. Oh, you're part of the landscape, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, All right. You've, you've you've helped create things that are continuing. I think. I hope so. The I mean, spirit of things, you know. I think. Um, I think. I think. I think there's a little bit of Nick O'Brien spirit in the Whitewater. Oh, interesting. I okay. Think so. Well, I'll, I'm eager to to explore it after we're done with this conversation. I'm going to walk around and uh, awesome. probably have another beer. They, the, the the IPA here was great. So it's nice. it, Brad is his name, right? Brad, Brad does yeah. the brewing. Yep. Cool. Mm-hmm. And I want to try to maybe swing over to uh, to Timekeeper as well. That's still nice. a really cool like venue. Yeah. For I was sure. in that building the first time Dan swung a hammer through the layers of drywall and got to the brick. I have a video <laughs> of that on my phone. The nice. first. The first demolishing nice. like force, uh, it was great. So I'm I'm happy to see that 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 place is doing so well too. So if uh, if people want to follow you or find you, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I'm not 
uh, I'm not super active on social media, but you can find me at Wisco Nico. That's a pretty un- universal uh, mm-hmm. tag, or a, I should say, handle that I use on Instagram and on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am on Facebook a bit, just under my name. I don't think that my my I don't I don't know how's Facebook. They don't have handles, do they? It's just your name. Yeah, I think it's just your name. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah so. And uh, is how about the Innovation District if people want to follow that? Yeah, uh, well, there's, it's freshtechinnovation.com is the website, and you can email me at nick at freshtechinnovation.com. Or if you want to know what I'm up to with my other business endeavors, my other projects, I'm doing some fun stuff with shipping containers too. <laughs> of course you are. Yeah. We didn't even talk about that. But right. We'll uh, save that for another episode um, maybe. <laughs> that's just uh, my, through my company called You Are Here. You Are Here. Uh, so nick at youarehere.community. Started in Wausau. Right, that was yeah. founded in Wausau. Mm-hmm. Right, coming all circle, circling all back to Wausau. Right, right. Maybe it'll, it'll maybe it'll come back someday. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm BC Kowalski. You can find our you can find our Facebook page, Keep It Wausau, on Facebook. Imagine that. Uh, otherwise, you can follow me BC underscore Kowalski on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, if you're watching the video, hey, make sure to subscribe so you can see all of our videos and hit the like button. I think Nick did a good enough job that we can give him a like, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think we can do that. Uh, special thanks to our producer, Harold Mello. As always, uh, check out his band Substyle on Spotify and iTunes and all the other uh, gizmos. And uh, our, our uh, beginning theme is from uh, is written by Bradley Sperger, especially for Live at Dailies. So, you know, that's... Uh, from the old one, but that's cool. And uh, I'm BC Kowalski. Uh, thanks for listening. And I always end it with saying, keep it awesome. So keep it awesome. Yeah, keep it awesome out there. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye.